Jesus is pronouncing some significant prophecies and statements here from about 33 to 39. The people were being divided. Uh, they, they were being convinced. Verse 40, the people said, you know, truly, this must be the prophet. But then other people were saying, but how can the Christ come out of Galilee instead of down south? In Bethlehem. So the people were divided. Some of the people would have laid hands on him. And the officers who were right there amongst the crowd of the people, they instead of grabbing Christ and taking him like they were sent to do, they went back. They just turned around and went back to their headquarters. And they, and they were defending Christ. Uh, nobody ever spoke like this man, they said. And so the Pharisees challenged them and said they were stupid, deceived. And then even Nicodemus uh, splits off from the, from the leadership there. And, uh, and so the, the leaders are divided. Officers and the people are divided. The officers and the leaders are divided. We have three statements of the upshot of Jesus' dealings with the people here at the Feast of Tabernacles. First of all, his brothers failed to know him. Secondly, this is where these little uh, ditto marks are in here, where the little arrows are. Uh, this is the great significance of, of this chapter. His brothers failed to know him. And then the people in the middle of the feast failed to know him. And at the end of the feast, the, you know, at the la eighth day of the feast, the Jewish leaders had, had failed to comprehend who he was. So the whole chapter highlights Jewish ignorance. And that's the significance of it. That makes the chapter understandable. Okay? So if we had to pick a sign, I'm not sure whether this, this chapter should be taken all by its lonesome, unrelated to chapter 9 and 10. But if we take it by itself, then the sign is Jesus telling people that they don't really know. The sign of the unknown teacher or prophet. The unknown Christ. That's the overview. Let's let's look at it a little more detail. <clears throat> you guys are gonna to have to open your eyes and look at your Bibles and put your heads in gear to stay awake, or I might as well. Uh, move to Florida and uh, tape it down there and let you read it and listen to it in your own time. How'd you like to do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that, Ken? They suggest that maybe instead of me moving to Florida, they move to Florida and do the same thing you do. Terrible to have to get up in the morning. What's happening in the first nine verses? I believe the background is given to us in verses 1 and 2. Would someone like to read this? Thank you, Blair. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Judea, because the Jews uh, uh, feast of tabernacles for his death. Okay, so the general time frame. Uh, some of the uh, relational information showing us Jesus' relationship with the people. Tells us where he is and when, sort of. In verses 3 to 5, we have ridicule of Jesus by his brothers. We have evident disbelief. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you do for there is no man that does anything in secret and he himself seeks to be known openly they were attributing to jesus some kind of far-fetched desire to be famous or something if thou do these things show thyself to the world for neither did his brothers believe in him like brethren in the face and brethren in the flesh. So it's true that the context is really starting to 
Yes. But I don't think it's... Uh, if it had been referring to the brothers in the faith, it would have referred to them as disciples, I'm sure. Because that term has already been used by John. Yeah. Anyways, we have ridicule and unbelief by his brothers. In verses 6 to 9, we have Jesus' self-defense. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come. And he stresses that twice, again down at the end of verse 8, for my time is not yet fully come. Your time is always ready. You could preach a good message on that phrase, your time is always ready. Sort of like today is the day of salvation. You know, harden not your hearts. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Where else in the Bible is that theme emphasized? The world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I testify of it that its words are evil. Jesus comes back to that. Okay. John chapter 17. Where else? Yes, in John chapter 15, in the upper room discourse, Jesus came back to it. Right? He elaborated it quite extensively. Right? We didn't get to that in our chapel the other day, but that's part of discipleship. All right? So Jesus expresses that uh, he has a unique time schedule that he's working on. He's not going to be pressured or bullied or ridiculed into stepping outside of his father's will. Uh, he is graciously extended to his own brothers in the face of ridicule an opportunity to be saved. He explains to them the difference between himself and them in relationship to the society in general, that they are ridiculing him. They have just suggested that you know, that he's like a charlatan trying to find followers, you know, in his gypsy-like travels. You know, they, they totally misunderstand that, that there are deep spiritual issues at stake here. And they, do, they don't, they totally misunderstood what Jesus is doing. He's testifying against the world. He's not trying to make followers. He's not trying to be famous. He's trying to speak the truth. They misjudge that. So it shows us the extent of his own brother's ignorance. And he challenges them, go up to this feast. I do not go yet up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And he remained in Galilee, and immediately after that his brothers left. Much like Joseph, right? His brothers were ganging up on him, and they were traveling in a pack, and he was the beloved of the father, separated by principles and uh, by a relationship and by purpose just you know almost like a world of his own a little different you know doing his father's will so this first section shows the ignorance of his own family the the extent of their misunderstanding you have to understand how old is Jesus here if Jesus is 30 the outset of his public ministry, maybe he's 31 now, right? A year or so into his public ministry. How, how old does this make his brothers? Pardon? Younger. I don't know how much younger. Right? Let's just say they're in their 20s. Okay. Um, they were sons of the covenant. No doubt they had already been bar mitzvahed, right? But they weren't old enough yet to um, to serve in, a, in an official capacity like Christ was. Now, Jesus was 30 years of age, a priest, in order to serve in, a, in an official capacity. He had to be 30 years of age. That's one of the requirements of the, of the law of Moses. We have immaturity here. We have uh, rashness. And it's compounded by the fact that these, these are the guys that live closest to Jesus. You know, they should have seen, should have known. But instead of producing a desired effect in their lives, they had responded naturally in, in a fleshly manner, rejecting the evidence that Jesus lived about, lived in front of them every day.
I, if I was going to preach on this and make a point of application, I would think that it would probably be appropriate for um, for many people who live and work in the church or in religious in a religious environment, supposedly having a more intimate opportunity to know Christ. You imagine, like many monks, even you know, joining the monasteries, and the priesthood. You know, they call themselves brothers, right? Um, supposedly having a more intimate knowledge of the Lord, whereas, in fact, many times it produces nothing more than a fleshly response of unbelief and ridicule. All right, now we have Jesus in Jerusalem in verses 10 to 13. The first movement produces a unique effect when his brothers had gone up, then Jesus, later, he went up privately. Then the Jews sought him at the feast, saying, Where is he? They're looking for the miracle worker. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. There's the positive reaction. Others said, No, he deceives the people. However, no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So there you have it. He hadn't even been in Jerusalem for a long time. And the uh, significance of his former works, of his influence, was being felt months after the fact. Unique effect number one, division. A powerful undercurrent of opinion among the masses. This is the people here. It's not saying, it's not referring specifically to the leadership. It's the people, the average man. In 14 to 31, we have the next movement. And it subdivides into three, three divisions. We have Jesus' unique doctrine in verses 14 to 24. Now, this is, of course, taking place uh, in a conversation. We have Jesus speaking and the people answering in verse 20, and then Jesus answering them in verse 21. All right? So it's a, it's a conversation, no doubt, but it, in it we find Jesus' unique teaching. In verses 25 to 27, we find Jesus' unique reputation. Something about Christ, about his claims to Messiahship become the focus. Unique reputation. And in verses 28 and 29, we find Jesus' unique relationship to the Father. Uh, verses 28 to 29, Jesus' unique relationship to his Father. Unique reputation. And in verses 30 to 31, I guess there's a fourth division. We have the, a unique effect. What is happening? I already read these verses before. Verses 30 to 31. Uh, some people sought to lay hands on him. They wanted to take him. But then many people believed on Jesus. So you have the populace divided. Now it's overt division. Before it was an undercurrent of opinion. You know, everybody had their own ideas. But now it's out in the open. And some people are, you know, they're going to act on their opinion. Right? Some of them are going to try to kill him. Because they don't believe. And other people are holding off the the wolves, as it were, because there's too much popular support for him publicly. Many people believed. This chapter, this, this period in Jesus' ministry, this one-week period is significant because it shows us the very theme for which the book was written. Why is the book of John written? To produce belief. In order to inculcate belief in people, John needs to highlight, by way of preparation, 
he needs to show his readers that there are only two possible responses. And at the very introduction of the book of John, he did this. John chapter 1, verse 11, 12, 13. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, there are a few. As many as received him, to them they have the right to become the sons of God. And so the book is written to cause the reader to believe, but John, has, from the outset, has emphasized and now we see it historically occurring in the experience of Christ that not everyone will, will believe, but there will be a division. Some people will not believe, some will not receive, others will, some will. And we have now advanced in the experience of the history of Christ to this point, a division. Okay? So 14 to 31 is the uh, next major movement in the chapter that uh, that brought about a decisive difference of opinion in the feast. Jesus was teaching in verse 14 and in verse 15 the Jews were evaluating him. They were marveling. They recognized that this was not natural learning. They knew that Jesus had never been to the rabbinical schools because they were the ones that ran the rabbinical schools. <laughs> this is where the rabbinical schools were. If you wanted to go to, to, to learn from a rabbi, you went to Jerusalem. Okay. In verses 16 to 19, we have Jesus' claims that instigated questions. He was claiming that his, own, his teaching was God's, not, not his own. He was claiming that anybody could know it if they just had the right mindset, right attitude, if any man. The English is not very clear there. The word will in the English language can refer to two things. What is one thing that the word will can refer to? To have a desire and will can sometimes be a descri description of what? Okay, the, as a noun, right? but as in its verbal forms, will can, can refer to desire, or it can refer to future action, right? It can be a prophecy, or it can be a statement of desire. Now, in this particular case, this is not a prediction. Jesus is saying, if any man will do his will, that is, wills to do his will, if any man desires to do God's will, if he has that mental perspective, there will be a result. He shall know the doctrine. You people have willed to do his will. That's why you're here this morning. At least at one time there was a decision. Right? So you have the desire. And because you have the desire, you will learn. You will grow. Right? You will advance. And that's the claim that Jesus is making. He's claiming, first of all, my teaching is not just human teaching. It's divine in origin. Secondly, any man, if, if he has the right attitude, can know it deeply know it by experience. This is his claims. And uh, he was claiming that Jesus Christ, that he himself was not seeking his own glory, but seeking the glory for his Father. So he was actually, uh, if his own brothers had been in the crowd listening to him, and if they had been believers, really wanting to know God's will, they would recognize that Christ wasn't trying to make followers here. He was trying to bring glory to his Father in heaven. Verse 18 is the answer, Jesus' answer to the dark insinuations of his brothers that we read up of up in verses 3 and 4 in this chapter. And Jesus defending himself here, verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? And he's, he's claiming none of you keep it. So why are you trying to kill me? I do not. I cannot fathom the the people's response in verse twenty. Uh, it must be ridicule, perhaps, is the only way you can describe it. When they said, "You have a demon," you know, you're possessed. Who's going about to kill you? How do how do we know that Jesus knew that people were going about to kill him?
Perhaps that's an inference. It actually says up in verse 2 or verse 1 in the introduction of the chapter. You know, Jesus, one of the reasons Jesus had refrained from being down here in the first place is because of what had happened six months prior. They tried to kill him in the temple. And these people are making fun of him. That can be, you know, it can't be a mere statement of their ignorance because uh, <laughs> they, full, they know full well. Unless the people, another possible explanation of this verse is that the people weren't aware of how serious the higher level opposition of the leadership was. You know, maybe this was an innocent question. So it either has to be ridicule, making fun of Christ by people that well knew that he was being threatened to death, or it was a simplistic question of ignorance. In verses uh, 21 to 24, Jesus gives his reasons. He's, he's making appeals here in, in self-defense. He says, I, I did one work, you people marveled at it. Um, you know, even Moses uh, taught that you could be circumcised on the Sabbath day. So what's wrong with, uh, with, with healing a person on the Sabbath day? Like, look at the spirit of the law, not just the letter. He's, he's really making an appeal to. Verse 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's a tremendous principle. And it equally applies to our own evaluation of people today, too. I haven't lived very long, but... Um, I have been through some problems with Christians, and I probably will be through some more. And I believe that the way you judge righteous judgment and not according to appearance is give it time, one way. One key principle is time is a good evaluator. If somebody is, you don't know how to take them if you question their motives, wait and watch. Right? Don't make rash judgments upon people. Right? Don't make, don't make quick accusations. Time will tell what they're really like. Right? Time tells what people are really like in a marriage. Time tells what people are really like in the leadership of churches. Right? Personal character. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And, and uh, what we're really like, you know, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. You can tell a false leader by fruit. It takes time for fruit to grow, doesn't it? It really does. It takes time. Right. So with the elapsed time and with longer term evaluation uh, and with your own heart's conviction of the Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit time to convince you sometimes of what is right and wrong. But I have, I have been smitten in my heart on a few occasions for decisions that I have made, quick, quick decisions. After I made the decision, you know, two or three days later, I was I was being bothered by it, you know, because I I was being convinced, I believe, by the Holy Spirit, that decision that I made at that you know at a previous time was not quite the right decision. And so judging righteous judgment, you have to be very careful that you don't. Have, Jesus could make be making an allusion here to fleshliness versus spiritual. Remember the Apostle Paul in Second Corinthians chapter four, he says, we. Uh, Oh, this is good. I like this. Second Corinthians chapter four. Verses sixteen to eighteen. For which cause we faint not, for though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, this is outward judgment, but at the things which are not seen. This is righteous judgment. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. Not only is Jesus telling these people to get their facts right, but he's appealing to them to get it, you know, to evaluate him in terms of the spirit of the, of the scriptures, not just the letter of their oral traditions. And I think he's probably making an appeal to their, to time. Give it time. Watch and evaluate. And, and further, he's making an appeal not to judge by mere appearance, that is, according to fleshly perspective, what you think you see, you know, what, what it just looks like, but what it really is like. 
by the unseen spiritual laws and truths that are characteristic of his person. That's an important verse. It's a very important principle as well. So in defending himself, uh, he was appealing to their uh, to the true spirit of the law and to a spiritual attitude by people. Verses 25 to 29 focus on the person of Christ. He has a unique reputation and he has a unique relationship to God. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that Jesus had just said in verse, uh, or the people had just claimed that, you know, that he must have been possessed because you know they didn't believe that he was anybody was going about to kill him. Verse 20, look at verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? <laughs> it's almost humorous. Of course everybody knew what was happening. What does the discussion in verses 26 to 27 revolve around? You tell me. Okay, we're trying to uh, understand the claims regarding Christ. So it's a question about the Messiahship of Christ, right? In the Jewish psych, um, there were lots of things that they were taught to expect regarding the Messiah. I'm going to have to do some research on that, find out some more about it. But in their theology books, uh, what the what the rabbis taught them about Christ was significant. And that's really what was involved here. The, these people claimed to have a basic knowledge of who G this per literal person Jesus was. They figured that he was from up north. And, uh, you know, you have to understand that 30 years' time has elapsed. Three decades have elapsed since Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Is it not true that some of the Jewish leaders at that time did know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? There must have been some people that knew the actual historical facts. Now whether this, this had been covered up could be debated. Well, probably it was covered up. You know, they, didn't, they probably didn't believe it, so why would they tell anybody? Right? So perhaps it's not surprising that the average person on the street didn't know the true facts about the origin of Christ, that he actually did fulfill the prophecy of Micah. See? Therefore, he actually did have the claim, the, 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 um, the biblical grounds for calling himself the Messiah, that the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. As it says right there, um, Verse 42, it came up a little bit later the same day. Has not the scripture said that Christ comes of the seed of David and out of the tribe of Bethlehem where David was? If Jesus came from Nazareth, he would probably, the Jewish people would not consider him on average, if they had to take a guess, probably not from the tribe of Judah. What tribe would, you know, what tribes were based in the north? Sure, Ephraim, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, uh, Dan. Those are the ones that were established in the north. The southern tribes were uh, Judah and Simeon and Benjamin. Right? Those are the ones in the south. And, uh, and so there's a double whammy effect here. Not only does this person not seem to fulfill the requirement that the Messiah come from Bethlehem, but... You know, from Bethlehem means Judah. He's coming from up north. We know where he's from. How can this guy be there? Superficial. Right? They just didn't know. The knowledge had not been transmitted down 
for the last 30 years from the people in the know. Okay? And they were claiming to know this. They, they, they were claiming to have an understanding that this Jesus of Nazareth was, couldn't be the Messiah. And Jesus was saying, no, no, you got it all wrong. <laughs> you, know, you don't really know me. You don't even have a basic idea, let alone discernment. Right? So this discussion about the origins of Christ's person connected to his claim to Messiahship is rather significant. They're intimately tied together because in the Jewish mind, Messiah had to come from a certain place and they, would, they were evaluating Jesus on this very point. Now it goes further, not just where he came from down here, but Messiah had to be a divine revealer. He had to be a prophet. See? Now, in order for that to happen, he had to come from God. Now this is, I find this significant because in verse 29, at the end of verse 28, Jesus said to these people, You know from where I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Jesus comes right back to the same point that he came back to with Nicodemus. Remember? I'm a heavenly messenger, Nicodemus. I'm not telling you my own things. I'm telling you things from heaven. Same message to John the Baptist. He whom God has sent speaks the truths of God. He does not speak of himself, and you do not receive his witness. It came up again in John chapter 5, when Jesus was in Jerusalem before, defending himself. He said, I'm not speaking my own words, I'm speaking the words only that my Father has sent me to speak. And here are the evidences, here's the witnesses in support of me. So Jesus is coming back to the fundamental issue, not only of his earthly origins, the place of his birth, which should have convinced them if they had known the facts, but he is claiming divine origin here. Not just earthly origin in Bethlehem, but divine origin in heaven. This is what's really at stake. Good commentary on this particular point is what Nicodemus said to Jesus, remember? What was it that Nicodemus opened his comments to Jesus with in John chapter 3? Rabbi, you know that you are a man come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Nicodemus spilt the evidence you know, that, that a miracle worker was a sign of someone with divine origin, divine authority, somebody down from heaven. And Nicodemus, this, this really picked Nicodemus is thinking and this is what it should have been doing for these people and they were claiming to know him and Jesus said you don't really know me because if you did you'd be coming like Nicodemus you know, that's the inference here you would have been recognizing that I come from a spiritual place well we should be able to finish this today So in verses 28 and 29, Jesus is claiming that he does not have superficial origins, that he actually does fulfill the messianic predictions, and that's inferred, and he's claiming that he's been sent by the Father. Unique relationship to God. He knows the Father, and he's from the Father. So the last division in the book, uh, in the chapter, verses 32 to 53, the third movement in the seventh chapter focuses on Jesus' relationship to the leadership, although he's with the people at the beginning. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So the background here is that uh, now the leadership has been informed, of the people's popular opinions and they're going to interrogate Christ and so they sent officers on a search and collect mission thirty three and thirty four we have Jesus claims and prophecies actually thirty three to thirty if you want a subdivision of this chapter or this part of the chapter thirty three 
to 36, we have Jesus' unique realm of activity. Unique realm of activity. 37 to 39, we have Jesus' unique offer. Unique ability. In verses 40 to 53, we have the effect. Unique effect, number three. Divided reaction. This is official. Now, as your outline puts it, we have a mutinous difference of opinion at the last. So, what was Jesus' unique realm of ministry? When these officers were standing in the crowd with all the people and they were sent to get Jesus, they hadn't... They, you can just imagine, they were just about ready to reach out and grab him, and Jesus moved away and started talking. So they were sat there spellbound, maybe crowded out by the group of people that were there. You know, if you were going to make a movie out of this, how would you put this? They just, just go up to get him, and Jesus sort of moves into the crowd and starts preaching. Look what he says in verses 33 to uh, 36. We have unique claims and the resulting consternation of the people. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you. Then I go to him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, there you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Here's the consternation. Where will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed, the diaspora? Will he go to Greece and... Uh, Persia? Well, where's he going to go that we can't go there? What manner of saying is this that he said, You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am there you cannot come? This is sort of like the, not quite the icing on the cake, because that came the next day, on the last day of the feast. But here we have Jesus saying something that sort of adds one more unique mysterious element to his person. First, so let's recap here, the development here. Jesus has said, look at, I'm, I'm teaching you things from heaven. It's not mine. It was, it's given to me by the Heavenly Father, and if you want to know it, you can know it. Right? And you should know who I am. You don't, but you should. If you did, you'd know the one that sent me. Right? And now he comes along and says, uh, this is predictive. It's not explaining the past. It's looking to the, far, to the future. This passage reminds me of another passage. Where else does this theme come up of Jesus going away and his followers would seek for him and they wouldn't be able to find him uh, and they wouldn't be able to follow immediately? This theme comes up again. Pardon? Uh, I'm not sure in the Olivet Discord, that's Matthew, but in John 16, Jesus did tell his disciples, look, at, I'm going away. You people are all upset, you know, <laughs> just because I told you I'm going away. They were. They were really upset. Peter voiced their, their doubts and their fears. And, and Jesus said, I'm going away, and uh, this is a little bit like a woman in travail, you know, the, the pain is there, but then you'll forget the pain when you when the child comes, you know, when when the expected and long-awaited one comes. So that's sort of our relationship now. So this was dramatically emphasized and elaborated upon later in the Upper Room Discourse. Interesting that these seed themes come up later in private. So this is a prediction concerning the future. Jesus was predict he was proving, he was going to tell them that uh, the Messiah came from heaven and he's going to return. You know, not in so many words, but this was the additional point that he was making, and they were going to be unable to follow him. 
Verses 37 to 39, we have Jesus' unique offer and unique ability. Capstone revelation in, in this particular week's event. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scriptures say, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the Spirit, whom they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is a prediction again. He, in verse 33 and 34, he was predicting his own departure. He was predicting that people would seek and not find. And now he was predicting the coming of the Holy Spirit. If any man thirst, come and drink. He that believes out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. I wouldn't have gotten that out of the passage. There may be some allusion here to um, the Old Testament uh, describing um, the Holy Spirit in terms of water. I, um, I'm not sure. Somebody try Isaiah 12, 3. You want to read that? Trace? And try Isaiah 43, uh, 20. And you want to look up Isaiah 44, 3. And I'll read Isaiah 55, 1. Go ahead. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water in the book of salvation. That's it. With joy shall you draw waters out of the well, out of the well of salvation. Okay. Next. These fields are under the jackals and the ostriches, and they give water from the wilderness and the rivers of the desert to be drink to the people. Okay. So God promises to water His people. Next one. Okay, that's probably the clearest one so far. What's that? 44.3? Isaiah 44.3. There's a connection there between the symbol of water and the Holy Spirit. So that's not a bad reference. Isaiah 55.1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters, and he that has no money, come. Buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come to the waters. There isn't a, an explicit reference in that chapter to the Holy Spirit. So probably that Isaiah 44, 3 reference is the best one. If these Jews were as familiar with their Old Testament as some of us are more familiar with the New, then they may have you know, some of them may have, their minds might have gone back to this passage of Scripture and they would have recognized it. Certainly, um, John, who is interpreting the significance of these events, interprets it this way, that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Capstone revelation, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Fullness of the Spirit. Of course, there are New Testament references that connect the symbol of washing to the Holy Spirit. Where are they? Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Even the renewing of the Holy Spirit, if you wish. Right? Okay, so this is the capstone revelation here in this week's events. Right? He's claimed divine origin. He's claimed messiahship. He's claimed that he's going to leave. He claims knowledge of God. He claims the giving of the Holy Spirit. This unique ability, a unique relationship, a unique offer. Only the Messiah gives this. It sort of reminds me of what Jesus had offered the woman at the well in John chapter 4. If you want another cross-reference, that he offered her living water. Right? Out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water.